My best friend was dating my girlfriend and told me with a smile. So I found a new girl. We got married, but she disappeared. I strolled into my usual hangout, a rustic bar and grill, and found a seat at a small table tucked in the back. I ordered a burger, fries, and a beer, and settled in to watch whatever was on TV. It was tuned to a public channel featuring a segment on classic country music legends, most of whom had passed on, though a few were still with us. The show had a nostalgic and somewhat somber tone as they shared the backstories of these icons. I was struck by how many of them had come from humble beginnings, scraping by with very little. As I was enjoying my meal, I glanced up and noticed my best friend, Tom, walking in with Sarah. A wave of disbelief hit me. Sarah was supposed to be my girlfriend. I had asked her to join me tonight, but she claimed she had prior plans with friends and suggested we meet up tomorrow instead. Sarah and I had been seeing each other for about six months, and I thought we were serious. We spent almost every weekend together, and I was starting to fall for her hard. She often said she felt the same. And we even talked about the idea of getting engaged, though we weren't in a hurry. We figured there was no need to rush since we were in a steady relationship. As the TV show ended, someone turned on the jukebox, and Patsy Cline's Crazy started playing. The lyrics hit me. I knew you'd love me as long as you wanted and then someday you'd leave me for somebody new. I couldn't help but wonder if Tom was that somebody new. The kicker was that Tom knew exactly how I felt about Sarah. It seemed the unspoken rule of not messing with a friend's girl didn't mean much to him. As the song played on, I kept my eyes on them as they acted like a couple. The final verse, crazy for thinking that my love could hold you. I'm crazy for trying and crazy for crying, and I'm crazy for loving you, echoed in my mind. I couldn't just sit there. I stood up, walked over to them, and Tom looked at me, his face turning serious. Jake, you should walk away before things get ugly, he warned. If I see you again, one of us will end up in the hospital, I shot back. And as for you, Sarah, we're done. You've shown me your true colors. With that, I left the bar. The next day, my phone wouldn't stop ringing. It was Sarah, but I had no desire to talk. Later. Tom called, and I decided to pick up. Jake, man, I'm really sorry, Tom began. You know I've always found Sarah attractive. We were chatting at work, and I asked her out, and she agreed. Don't give me that crap, Tom. You knew she was my girl, and you asked her out anyway. How many times have you been with her? Jake, it was only. How many times, Tom? Don't lie. Three times, Jake. We've been together three times. We kind of developed feelings for each other. I'm sorry. And what about Melissa? Does she know you've been cheating on her? She deserves better than you. I don't ever want to see you again. And as for Sarah, you two can have each other, I said before hanging up. Melissa was Tom's girlfriend, and the three of us worked at the same factory. There's a whole story behind how we met, but that's for another time. My phone rang again, and this time it was Sarah. I figured I might as well hear her out. Jake. I'm sorry. Tom asked me out a few times, and eventually, I said yes. It didn't mean anything. Don't lie, Sarah. I talked to Tom, and he told me you were together at least three times. Probably more. Was it the money? Good luck with that. You two gold diggers deserve each other. I'm done with you, and the only person I feel sorry for is Melissa. She thought you and Tom were her friends. Stay out of my life. I grew up in West Virginia, the oldest of eight kids. I played football in high school, and during my senior year, I was offered a scholarship to a college in Indiana. I was 6 feet 3 inches and weighed about 250 pounds, playing as an offensive lineman. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college, so I jumped at the chance. I wanted to study civil engineering because I enjoyed working with my hands. I was a bit of a shy guy, but having sisters taught me to treat women with respect. My mom always said, Treat girls the way you'd want your sisters to be treated. At college, I made friends with a guy named Tom. He was outgoing, though not into sports. He had a sharp mind and mentioned that his family had some money. He wasn't rolling in it now, but he hinted there might be an inheritance down the road. He was studying business management. When football didn't occupy my time, we'd hang out together. Tom was a natural with the ladies, and we went to a lot of parties. Women seemed to flock to him and I have to give him credit for helping me break out of my shell a bit. After graduation, I stayed in Indiana and got a job as a civil engineer with a construction firm. 
The pay was good, and I found a small apartment near the job site. I also bought a used pickup truck. Every month, I'd send $400 back home to help out my parents. My dad was a coal miner, and our family was close-knit. Tom found a job at a local warehouse, which turned out to be a supplier for my company. Eventually, he worked his way up to being the warehouse manager. We hung out on weekends, and he told me about his girlfriend, Melissa, who worked with him as an inventory control supervisor. Tom introduced me to Melissa, and I could have easily fallen for her, but I had a rule about not getting involved with a friend's girl. It was a tough decision, but I respected that boundary. I did go on a few dates with some women from my company, but nothing serious. I didn't join Tom and Melissa on double dates often because being around Melissa stirred up feelings I couldn't act on. She was always kind to me, though. Tom invited me to their company's Christmas party since they were one of our suppliers. I figured why not and decided to go. At the party, I met a woman named Sarah. She was curvy and attractive, dressed a bit more provocatively than Melissa, and had a flirty nature. She worked as a secretary for one of the executives at Tom's company. We hit it off, and after chatting about our jobs, we spent the night dancing. We decided to see each other again, and even join Tom and Melissa for New Year's Eve. Melissa made a comment about being happy for me, but something about her tone seemed off. That night, I brought Sarah back to my place, and let's just say, she didn't disappoint. The next morning, Sarah seemed surprised by my modest apartment. I explained that I was still starting out in my career and didn't need much since I was also sending money home to my family. I told her that one day I'd think about upgrading, but I wasn't focused on material things right now. She asked if it was true that Tom's family had money, and I confirmed it since Tom was my closest friend. Our relationship continued, and we went out almost every weekend. My feelings for Sarah deepened, and she seemed to reciprocate. We shared many experiences, and yes, the physical aspect of our relationship was a highlight. However, her constant flirting with other men and obsession with material wealth began to wear on me. I tried to reassure her that we could build a good life together, but something felt off during our double dates with Tom and Melissa. There was an underlying tension I couldn't quite place. About six months into our relationship, Sarah and I discussed our future, even considering engagement, though we agreed not to rush. At a local fair, I bought her a friendship ring, telling her it symbolized that she was mine until she was ready to take the next step. She smiled as she slipped it on. I should mention that I had started working out three days a week after work and had slimmed down to 220 pounds. I felt pretty good about myself. Then came that fateful night at the bar and grill. Seeing Tom and Sarah together, kissing, broke me. After confronting them at the bar and having that phone call with Tom, I cut both of them out of my life. I was furious, but I also felt sorry for Melissa. Two weeks passed, and then one day, Melissa called me. Jake, I'm so sorry about what happened with Sarah. I thought she might do something like this, but I never imagined it would be with Tom. What do you mean, Melissa? Are you saying she's done this before? I saw her having lunch with her boss, Peter, a few times. It seemed like a regular thing. I thought about telling you, but I didn't want to hurt you in case I was wrong. When I found out about her and Tom, I ended things with him right away. It's hard seeing them at work, but I'm staying busy. Thanks for reaching out, Melissa. I was worried about you. You're one of my closest friends. Maybe we can catch up sometime? I'd like that, Jake. It's good to talk to you. After our conversation, I wasn't sure if I felt better or worse. A couple more weeks went by, and while I was grocery shopping, I ran into Melissa. Hey Jake, it's great to see you. How are things? Pretty good, and you? Back in the dating game? She smiled. I've turned down a few offers. I've got my eye on someone special, and I don't want to mess things up if he decides to ask me out. Oh, I see. Well, I was actually going to ask if you'd like to. Yes. I'd love to go out with you. You're the one I was hoping would ask. Great. How about Saturday? We could hit up that bar and grill. Sounds perfect. Let me know how to dress. I arranged to pick her up at 6 p.m. When I arrived at her place, she was dressed in jeans, a vest, a cowgirl hat, and boots. She looked amazing. I opened the truck door for her, and we headed to the bar. Saturdays featured live country music, so we grabbed a booth and ordered beers. The band wasn't starting for another hour, giving us plenty of time to talk. 
I was surprised to learn that Melissa was originally from West Virginia, just the county over from where I grew up. She had attended college there, then applied for jobs before landing one at the supply plant in Indiana. We ordered our food. I got a double bacon cheeseburger, and she chose a Reuben sandwich. We shared the fries. It felt great to reconnect with her. She asked if this was the same bar where I caught Tom and Sarah. I confirmed it was, but told her I wasn't going to let a couple of cheaters ruin my favorite spot. She just smiled. When the band started playing, we got up to dance. They opened with a couple of slow songs to get the couples on the floor. They always played the classics, the kind of music the crowd loved. They switched to a faster beat, and we sat down. I told Melissa that I wasn't much for fast dances, but I enjoyed watching the ladies move to the music. They played a few Roy Orbison tunes, and I've always had a soft spot for his music. Then came some songs by Loretta Lynn, and Melissa and I returned to the dance floor for the slow ones. The announcer invited the ladies to join a line dance, and a few guys joined in too. Why don't you join the line dance? I teased. You just want to see my butt move, she joked with a smile as she got up to join the other women. I watched as she danced, giving her a little cheer and clap when she gave her hips a playful shake. After the song ended, she came back to me with a smile, and I leaned in to kiss her. Pulling back, I apologized, but she wasn't having it. I'm not sorry, she said, kissing me again. We had a fantastic time dancing and sipping beers. The night flew by, and before we knew it, they announced the last song. I held Melissa close as we swayed to the music. As the song ended, I kissed her again. I dropped her off at her place and asked if she'd like to go out again next Saturday. I suggested we visit an amusement park. She agreed, and we exchanged another kiss goodnight. I didn't want to rush things on our first date, but I felt great all week at work. On Friday, I called Melissa to confirm our plans for the amusement park. She had heard of it but never been, so we were both excited. On Saturday morning, I picked her up and we headed out. We talked during the drive, and I brought up whether she had told Tom or Sarah that we were dating. She said she hadn't spoken to either of them about it. We had a blast at the park, riding all the roller coasters and catching various shows. We stopped for dinner at a Texas-themed restaurant on the way back. By the time I dropped her off, we were both exhausted. Melissa lived with a roommate named Jane, a friendly woman in her 50s who worked at a local store. Melissa appreciated having a roommate who treated her like family, and they were close. I told Melissa I'd be out of town the following weekend, but would love to see her the weekend after. She said I should call her when I got back. After getting home, I didn't waste any time and called her again. I invited her to a formal dinner that my boss was hosting in honor of his wedding anniversary, which would be held at a hotel. I mentioned I'd booked a room for the night since there would be drinking involved and I didn't want to drive home. I told her I'd understand if she wasn't comfortable with that. Jake, I'd be delighted to go with you, she said. And we don't need two beds, you know? I want you to know that I'm falling in love with you. Just promise me you won't lead me on. I would never hurt you, Melissa and I'll make sure no one else does either. Could we use your car? I'd rather not show up at a fancy event in my truck. Of course, we can take my car. I'll let Jane know I won't be home that night. I parked my truck at her place, and we drove to the hotel. We arrived early to get ready. While Melissa was in the shower, I got dressed in the bathroom, donning a tuxedo. When I walked into the bedroom, Melissa looked stunning in a blue dress that hugged her figure, her hair cascading to her shoulders. She had a sophisticated yet alluring presence. You look amazing. I might not even care about the party itself, I remarked. Oh no, you don't. I didn't get all dressed up just to change again, she replied with a smile, and we headed downstairs to the event. My boss and his wife greeted us warmly. He introduced his wife, and we exchanged pleasantries before they moved on. I noticed him stealing a glance at Melissa. Knowing most of the guests, I introduced her to the ones I knew, and she received compliments from everyone. We grabbed drinks and found a table. The appetizers were served, with dinner planned for later. Melissa recognized a couple of women she worked with, and I excused myself to chat with Mary, our head of HR. Mary, are there any openings in inventory control or supply chain? As a matter of fact, there is. Janice is retiring next month, and I've been tasked with finding her replacement. Do you have someone in mind? Actually, yes. My day tonight, Melissa, is looking for a new opportunity. 
She currently handles inventory control, enjoys it, but is ready for a change. Tell her to see me on Monday, and I'll set up an interview. She's quite the catch, isn't she? Mary said with a chuckle. The party was a blast. I danced with a few of the employees' wives, and Melissa danced with their husbands, but mostly we danced together. The dinner was fantastic, offering roast beef, chicken, and shrimp, along with all the sides. After a few more drinks, we said our goodbyes and headed up to our room. Melissa, are you sure about this? I don't want you to think I'm taking advantage of you, I asked. Jake, stop overthinking. Just be with me, she replied, helping me out of my tuxedo. We carefully hung up our clothes, pulled down the covers, and well, you know how it goes. I turned off the lights, and we snuggled in close, drifting off to sleep. The last words I heard before dozing off were, I love you, Jake. I woke up to the smell of fresh coffee. Melissa had already showered, dressed, and brewed us each a cup. Morning, Jake. Sleep well? It's been a while, I replied. After a quick shower and a cup of coffee, we went down to the dining room for breakfast. We saw quite a few familiar faces, all smiling at us. Looks like we've become a known couple, I mentioned to Melissa. Mary stopped by our table on her way out and told Melissa, See you Monday, with a smile. What was that about? Melissa asked. I forgot to mention that you have an interview with Mary on Monday at the company, I said with a grin. Remember, you were thinking about changing jobs? Tears welled up in her eyes as she whispered, Jake, I hope this isn't a dream. I love you so much. We chatted on the way home. I told her that in two weeks, I planned to visit my parents in West Virginia and that I'd love for her to join me. I was leaving on Friday evening and returning Sunday. I also suggested we could stop by to see her parents if she wanted. I'd love to come with you, Jake. But just so you know, my parents are traditional, so we might not be sharing a bed. I'm sure it'll all work out, I said. Final update. We set off for West Virginia, and on the way, Melissa mentioned that Tom and Sarah were getting married next month because Sarah was visibly pregnant. She thought Sarah believed she was marrying into money, but she'd soon realized that Tom's wealth was mostly an illusion. I explained that Tom's lifestyle was funded by debt, not real wealth. When we arrived at my parents' home, we were greeted by a spacious, old farmhouse with several bedrooms and bathrooms. My siblings who still lived there came out to welcome us, followed by mom and dad. I introduced Melissa, and she received warm hugs from everyone. We spent hours talking. I knew my family would love Melissa. She noticed an old photo of me in my football uniform and got emotional. What's wrong? Are you okay? I asked. Jake, do you remember that time you played football at Ashford during an away game? After the match, you walked through a tunnel, and two guys were trying to drag a girl in a yellow sweater into the tunnel. You stepped in, threw one of them down, and tackled the other. You told them if they ever bothered her again. You'd be back to finish what you started, then you walked away. Yeah, I remember that. But I never told anyone. How do you know about it? Jake, I was that girl. I never saw your face, just the number 74 on your jersey. I tried to find you afterward, but no one knew who you were. I only found out your name was Jake, but that was it. I was waiting for my friend when those guys grabbed me, dragged me into the tunnel, and said they wanted to have some fun. I screamed for help, and that's when you showed up. They never bothered me again, she explained, tears in her eyes. She leaned in and kissed me. There was something familiar about you when I first met you. Now I know why. Later that night, Mom had prepared a guest room for Melissa and told me I could sleep in the basement. Around one in the morning, Melissa joined me. We shared a quiet moment before she returned to her room about an hour later. The next day, we visited Melissa's family. I hadn't known her parents were well off until we pulled up to their lovely house. She had two younger sisters who were equally beautiful. She introduced me as her boyfriend and I overheard her sister, Emily, telling Melissa I was quite a catch. Inside, we chatted with her parents. Her dad, Mr. Harper, asked about my job and background, clearly protective of his daughter. Mr. Harper, I'd like to talk to you about marrying your daughter. I'm here to ask for your blessing, I said, surprising both Melissa and her parents. Jake, you didn't have to ask, but I appreciate it. You should know by now that Melissa follows her heart. Melissa, do you love Jake? Yes, Dad, I love him very much. 
then you have my blessing on one condition. You two must get married here in West Virginia so your mom and I can give you a proper wedding, and we'll cover the costs. I pulled out an engagement ring from my pocket, got down on one knee, and proposed. Melissa said yes, kissed me, then hugged her parents, who were shedding tears of joy. We all celebrated with a fantastic dinner. Back at my parents' house, we shared the news, and they were thrilled. My relatives who lived nearby came over for a barbecue. Dad took charge of the grill, while Mom and Melissa handled the sides. My family welcomed Melissa with open arms. After a day of celebration, we said our goodbyes and promised to keep everyone updated on the wedding plans. That night, Melissa and I had another quiet moment together. We tried to keep things discreet, but you know how that goes. She didn't head back upstairs until almost five in the morning. The next morning, over breakfast, Mom and Melissa exchanged knowing smiles. We had a hearty country breakfast before saying our goodbyes and heading home. On Monday, Melissa had her interview, and by Tuesday, she got a call from Mary offering her the job. She called to share the good news, but I was already in the loop. We celebrated with dinner at our favorite bar. Melissa mentioned that Tom and Sarah were on vacation, off to Las Vegas to get married. She said it was the best two weeks she'd had at work, not having to deal with them. She also mentioned that everyone was sad to see her leave, but understood she was moving on to a better opportunity. Working at my company meant having one of the highest paying jobs in the area, and Melissa felt lucky to have secured the job. She kept our engagement a secret, only revealing it to close friends. Before she left, she placed an anonymous note on Tom's desk, suggesting he get a DNA test once the baby was born, given Sarah's frequent lunches with her boss. She signed it with a simple congratulations. As the wedding approached, Melissa's roommate, Jane, helped with the planning. Jane acted like a mother figure to Melissa, and they shared living expenses. I visited a few times a week to help out. I asked mom for a list of relatives and friends to invite, and she went ahead and bought invitations, handling that for us. We set the wedding date for four months later. Melissa's parents took care of finding a church and a venue for the reception. Her dad's business connections ensured everything went smoothly. I was anxious but excited as the big day approached. Many of my co-workers planned to attend, even though the wedding was in West Virginia. Thanks to Jane's connections, we found a dressmaker for Melissa's gown. Jane also confirmed that she and her daughter would attend. Melissa's mom, Sophie, arranged for a caterer and gave us a headcount as the date neared. Sophie also mentioned that her husband, Hank, had hired a great band. Everything was falling into place. I asked Melissa if she thought the wedding preparations were getting out of hand, knowing it would be expensive. Jake, this grand wedding is my parents' dream. They've wanted this for us since we were little. My sisters will have similar weddings. Why didn't you tell me about your family's wealth before? I wanted you to love me for who I am, not for my money. Only Jane knows about this, not even Tom. Does this change anything for you? No. I love you for you. If you want, I can sign a prenuptial agreement. Jake, there's no need for that. We'll be together forever. Besides, I don't have much now, maybe someday through inheritance, but for now, I just want a loving husband. Melissa finalized her wedding party. Her dad would walk her down the aisle, her older sister would be the maid of honor, and her younger sister and my two married sisters would be bridesmaids. My brothers-in-law would be groomsmen, and my single brothers would pair with her sisters. My younger brother was my best man, and my niece and nephew were the flower girl and ring bearer. Everyone was thrilled to be involved. Melissa was thriving in her new job, and everyone admired her. She was loved by her colleagues. A dilemma arose since she had only been there for a few months and hadn't accrued much vacation time. We considered a whirlwind wedding weekend, but just two weeks before the wedding, the plant manager called me to his office. Jake, I heard you're facing a tight schedule for the wedding. Mary mentioned you're leaving Friday, getting married Saturday, and returning Sunday. Is that right? Yeah, Mark, that's the plan. Melissa doesn't have much time off. Well, make sure you let your lovely wife know we're giving her personal time off from Thursday through the next week. Oh, and here are two tickets for a four-day cruise as a wedding gift. Thanks, Mark. She's going to be thrilled. I shook his hand and called Melissa to invite her out for lunch, telling her I had important news. At the restaurant, Melissa asked, What's up, Jake? Mark called me in today. 
He said you're getting time off from Thursday through the entire next week. We don't have to rush. And wait, there's more. I placed the cruise tickets on the table. Tears welled up in her eyes as she realized how much easier our plans had just become. With everything ready, we headed to West Virginia on Thursday. The rehearsal and dinner took place on Friday. I asked Dad if he needed money for the wedding, but he told me he had saved everything I'd sent him since we announced our plans. I respected him even more for that. After dinner, I kissed Melissa goodnight, knowing we'd be married the next day. Melissa's mom handled the guest list, not telling me the total number to avoid adding to my nerves. I knew all my siblings, aunts, uncles, and their families would be there. The local motels had been fully booked for months, so I hoped our guests found accommodations. On Saturday morning, I woke up and mom insisted I have breakfast, knowing I'd need it for the long day ahead. Over breakfast, she mentioned that she and dad had met the Harpers and thought highly of them. After eating, I took a long shower and shaved, then got dressed in my white tuxedo to match Melissa's dress. My brothers were also in black tuxedos as part of the wedding party. We headed to the church, which was about 20 miles away in the next county. The church was large, holding over 600 people. As guests arrived, my brothers and I helped them find their seats. Joan and her daughter arrived, and I directed them to sit with Melissa's family. My co-workers, including my boss Mark and his wife, flew in for the occasion. I was then told to go to the front of the church because Melissa's limousine had arrived, and it was time to start. I stood beside the minister as the wedding began. First down the aisle was Emily, escorted by my brother, followed by Melissa's other sister and another brother. My married brothers walked with their wives, then my nephew came down as the ring bearer, though I had the actual ring in my pocket. My niece followed, scattering rose petals. Then, the music shifted, and everyone stood as Melissa walked down the aisle with her proud father. She looked breathtaking, like an angel. Who gives this woman to this man? The minister asked. Her mother and I, her father replied. We exchanged vows, and I placed the ring on her finger. You may now kiss the bride, the minister announced, and I did just that. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Jake Johnson, he declared. The church erupted in applause as we stood at the door, thanking each guest as they left. It took over half an hour for everyone to clear out and head to the reception hall. At the hall, drinks and appetizers were served as a band played. We entered to a standing ovation, took our seats, and listened to Mr. Harper say a few words before announcing that dinner was ready. The serving tables were well organized, ensuring everyone got their food quickly. Though Melissa and I were served first, we finished last, thanks to frequent interruptions for kisses. The tables were pushed back to make room for dancing. Melissa and I took the first dance, followed by the wedding party, then everyone else joined in. The reception lasted for four hours, with some guests even going back for seconds. It was a fantastic night. After settling into our new home and getting accustomed to married life, things were going well. At least, that's what I believed. Melissa and I had quickly found our rhythm and it seemed like our future was bright. We had both come a long way from our past relationships, and our bond felt strong, unbreakable even. But one evening, something happened that would change everything. It was a Friday night, a few weeks after we had celebrated our six-month anniversary. Melissa had stayed late at work to finish up a big project. I was at home, unwinding after a long week. I had just finished grilling some steaks for dinner, and was waiting for Melissa to come home. The house was quiet with only the faint hum of the dishwasher in the background. I glanced at the clock. It was nearly 8 p.m. Melissa hadn't called, which was unusual, but I figured she was caught up at work. I shot her a quick text, asking when she'd be home. As I waited for her reply, a soft knock sounded at the front door. My heart skipped a beat. No one ever knocked on our door at that hour. I quickly walked over and peeked through the peephole. To my surprise, I saw a middle-aged man tall and rugged, standing on our porch. His face was unfamiliar, but there was something unsettling about his presence. I hesitated for a moment before opening the door. Can I help you? I asked cautiously. The man didn't immediately respond. He just stood there, looking at me with an intensity that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Finally, he spoke in a low, gravelly voice. Are you Jake Johnson? He asked 
his eyes narrowing as they bore into mine. Yes, that's me. And you are. I'm Detective Harris from the local police department, he said, flashing a batch. May I come in? I stepped aside, motioning for him to enter. My mind was racing. What could a detective want with me? As he walked in, I noticed he was carrying a manila folder under his arm. Is something wrong? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Detective Harris didn't answer immediately. Instead, he took a seat at our dining table and motioned for me to do the same. He placed the folder on the table, but didn't open it. I need to talk to you about your wife, Melissa, he said finally, his tone grave. My heart dropped. What about her? Is she okay? Jake, he began. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I need you to be completely honest with me. When was the last time you saw Melissa? She left for work this morning, around 7.30, I replied, feeling a knot form in my stomach. She said she was staying late to finish a project. Did she mention where she was going after work? No, she was supposed to come straight home. Why? What's going on? Detective Harris leaned forward, his expression unreadable. Melissa's car was found about an hour ago, abandoned on the side of the road near the old warehouse district. There were no signs of a struggle, but the circumstances are suspicious. A cold chill ran down my spine. Suspicious? What do you mean? Where is she? That's what we're trying to determine, Harris said, his voice measured. The area where her car was found isn't somewhere you'd expect a person to be late at night, especially not alone. We're treating this as a possible abduction. I felt the room spinning around me. Abduction? This couldn't be happening. Not Melissa. Are you sure? I mean, could she have gone somewhere and just... Jake! The detective interrupted, his voice firm. I understand this is difficult, but we need to consider all possibilities. I'm here to ask you if there's anything you can tell me, anything unusual in her behavior recently, any threats she might have received, or anyone who might have wanted to harm her. I shook my head, still in shock. No, nothing like that. We've been happy, really happy. There's been nothing out of the ordinary. I, I don't understand. Harris sighed, leaning back in his chair. We're going to do everything we can to find her, but I need you to stay calm and cooperate. We're also going to need to take a look around your house, if that's all right with you. I nodded, feeling completely numb. Of course, whatever you need. As Detective Harris got up to start his search, I stood there in a daze. How could this be happening? One minute, I was waiting for my wife to come home for dinner, and the next, a detective was telling me she might have been abducted. Harris walked through each room methodically, checking every corner, every closet, every space where someone could hide. As he moved through our bedroom, he paused in front of Melissa's nightstand. He opened the drawer and after a moment, pulled out a small, black notebook. Jake, do you know what this is? He asked, holding it up. I frowned. No, I've never seen that before. He opened the notebook and started flipping through the pages. His expression darkened as he read. This is a journal, he said after a moment, and it looks like Melissa was keeping some things from you. What do you mean? I asked, my voice trembling. He didn't respond right away, instead reading aloud a few lines from one of the entries. I'm afraid of what will happen if Jake finds out. I never meant for things to go this far, but now I don't know how to get out. Tom said he'd keep quiet, but I don't trust him. And if Jake ever finds out about the money. The words hit me like a punch to the gut. Money? What is she talking about? Harris closed the notebook and looked at me his eyes filled with something I couldn't quite place. Pity, perhaps? Or was it something darker? It seems your wife might have been involved in something she didn't want you to know about. Something involving Tom, and possibly some money. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. But that doesn't make sense. Melissa and I, we were happy. She wouldn't do something like that. She wouldn't lie to me. People can be very good at hiding things, Jake, Harris said quietly especially when they're afraid of the consequences. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My wife, the woman I loved, the woman I trusted with my life, had been keeping secrets from me. And now she was missing, possibly in danger, and I didn't even know who she really was. As Detective Harris continued his investigation, I sat on the edge of the bed, staring blankly at the floor. My mind was a whirlwind of emotions, 
fear, anger, betrayal. I had thought Melissa and I had moved past the ghosts of our past relationships. I had thought we had a future together. But now, everything was unraveling, and I was left with nothing but questions and a growing sense of dread. An hour later, just as Harris was wrapping up his search, my phone buzzed on the nightstand. I picked it up, hoping against hope that it was Melissa. But when I looked at the screen, it wasn't her number. It was an unknown number. With shaking hands, I answered the call. Hello? There was a brief silence on the other end, and then a voice spoke. A voice that sent a shiver down my spine. Jake, the voice said, low and menacing. If you want to see your wife again, you're going to do exactly what I say. My blood ran cold. Who is this? What do you want? The voice chuckled darkly. Let's just say I'm someone who knows your wife very well, and I know what she's been hiding from you. If you want her back, you're going to have to pay for it. Pay for it? How much? I'll do whatever you want. Just, just don't hurt her. It's not about money, Jake. It's about payback. You'll find out soon enough. The call ended abruptly, leaving me in a state of shock. I turned to Detective Harris, who had been watching me closely. That was them, I said my voice barely above a whisper. They have Melissa, and they're demanding something from me. Harris nodded grimly. We'll trace the call, see if we can pinpoint their location. But Jake, you need to be prepared for anything. This could be more than just a ransom. It could be personal. As the reality of the situation began to sink in, I felt a wave of helplessness wash over me. The life I had built with Melissa was falling apart before my eyes and there was nothing I could do to stop it. All I could do was hope that I would get her back, and that we could somehow find a way to move forward. But deep down, I knew that nothing would ever be the same again. 